We live in a world of unchallenged, untruthful messages about Jesus, right? Is that right? That's why when I go somewhere and I'm talking to people and God comes into the conversation, I start getting a lot of that for things that I don't believe that. God didn't say that, Jesus didn't say that, but somebody has seen it somewhere from a church. Or somebody, somewhere on the radio or the telly has told them that. There's untruthful messages about Jesus being conveyed all the time, either verbally or non-verbally, by the way people are acting and behaving. Does that make sense? So, for example, I go into a place uh, as, as a Christian, and they say to me, Don't you come here preaching at us? I haven't come here to preach at you. Or they say, You Christians, you... And, and hang on, have you heard me say that? And those are the sorts of things probably we've had to say in the course of the last week as we chat with people. Because it ain't what we're about. The world is full of untruthful, misleading messages about Jesus. Either because they're coming verbally at people, and they're wrong, or because people are observing something from those who are presumed to be Christian, or who are Christian, but uh, they've gone a little bit off peace at the moment, and it isn't helping. Because the truth about Jesus isn't served like that. The lie is. So given that we live in a world of unchallenged, untruthful messages about Jesus, verbal and non-verbal, why would we be surprised when people don't want to follow him? If the world is full of miscommunicating what Jesus is about, are you surprised people don't want to follow him? It seems to me our land needs much clearer, much more explicit and consistent, and consistent, not inconsistent, and consistent, testimony and testimonial witness to about Jesus. Because the message is out there and it's wrong. It's not the right message. So people expect us to be here on a Sunday, for example, being bitter and critical about the people who are not. So people expect that if they come along here, they will be given a good ranting about what awful people they are. And they want to go chapel. Right? They assume that's what we're about. Our land needs much clearer testimony to Jesus so that what people reject, if they reject, is actually the truth about Jesus. What he's about, no, he's not about. I don't know, because you're also tired, I don't know whether I haven't been clear or whether I'm now flogging a dead horse. Which territory are we in? Is this dead horse territory? So what is clearer testimony to Jesus then? What is that clearer testimony? How do you do that? What is important for it to happen? We've got an example here in John chapter 1. Uh, as Jesus first sets out his Galilean ministry in, in John's account of it, of exactly the things we're needing to know. Because here, in the beginning of John's Gospel, we come up against some really important foundations. One, from John the Baptist's testimony about himself, we learn the importance of it being clear about who it is that you are and are not. It is important for Christians to be clear about who they are and who they are not. Because there are many mixed messages about who and what Christians are. We need to be clear about who we are and who we are not in particular. Secondly, from John the Baptist's testimony, not about himself but about Jesus, we learn the importance of being clear about who Jesus is. It's not about who I am necessarily, it's much more about who he is. And John shifts that emphasis, verses 29 to 34 of John chapter 1. And then from John's disciple, John's disciple, Andrew, and from his testimony about Jesus, we learn the importance of being clear about what you have learned from your personal encounter with Jesus. And that's what verses 35 to 42 are about. Guys, that's going to become clearer in a minute. Let me just take you through. Firstly, in John chapter 1, verses 19 to 28, John's testimony about John. This is our testimony about ourselves, who we are. We are not. John is so very clear with these people, with these religious people, with all their misconceptions, all their preconceived ideas that are wider than Mark, he is very, very clear with them about who he is not. And very consistently in this part of the world, in our culture, in our time, we need to be clear about what it is we are not saying, what it is we do not stand for, who it is we are not. Effective communication requires that where people have got misconceived idea of the truth about who we are. <coughs> are you the Messiah? 
John did not fail to confess, John 1.20, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. I am not. Now, wouldn't it be flattering for pride if they were actually oh, possibly not. <laughs> Watch it. We've got to be very, very careful about not accepting praise from men, compliment from men, which isn't true about God, isn't true about ourselves, miscommunicates the gospel. <coughs> He's such a lovely man, very Christian. Are those two things the same? same thing, be a nice kind of Christian. That's the religion of works. When people express it to you like that. That's not what the gospel is about. That is a denial of what the gospel is about. Now if you're saying, oh that guy, he used to be such a handful. He was such a waste. He was so bad to his missus, but look at him now, he's a Christian. See the difference? It doesn't glorify the guy. It glorifies the Jesus whose grace has changed him. Now we're not all, you know, we all haven't been there. But our testimony is consistent with this. I am not more than I am. And they say to him, are you the Messiah? The Messiah, the long-awaited, anointed of God, expected by many at this time, longed for by many at this time, to set his people free from Roman domination, lead a new exodus, generally triumphal stuff like that. Things people wanted to hear. Are you the one? <coughs> I am not your hope. Be consistently ready to say to the sake of a clear testimony about Jesus. Be consistently ready to say to people, I am not your hope. But I know someone who is. And that of course is humbling to our human pride, and it's quite right that our human pride should be humbled like that. John is going to say more about Jesus being the biblical Messiah, but at the moment he's just keen to assert that he is not this one to whom the scriptures of the Old Testament point as the coming Saviour. Are they the Messiah? I'm not. Then they asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? Oh, Elijah's one of my heroes. I would love to be Elijah. You know, he's one of those, he's a proper guy, isn't he? <laughs> you know, that, all that stuff on Mount Carmel and Prophets of Baal. You know, I'd be a man for that, you know. But I could only play the role. In a play. <laughs> In a pretend. And we're not here to pretend. We're here to be true. Are you Elijah? Elijah was a hugely significant Old Testament prophet. Of course he was. And his return was expected on the basis of Malachi 4.5 before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Are you the Elijah who's bringing the day of the Lord going to set his people free and wash through the Red Sea and all that? Huh? Redemption. Hmm. Hard to disappoint people sometimes, isn't it? You know, tell them what they want to hear. Now, it's a bit of a complicated one, because Jesus seems to know more about John than John does, because in a different context and against a different background, Jesus does identify John the Baptist as Elijah. And this is an important thing. What you've got here is a bunch of religious leaders who think Elijah is X in the plans of God. But actually, he's F. Okay? You with me? They think, if I say to them, John is Elijah. They're going to go right prepared to rebel against the Romans and let's get the war on. That's not the Elijah that John is. If John says, yes, I'm Elijah, in that context, he's saying something different to what Malachi 4 5 is saying about Elijah and what God means by it. Isn't there a lesson there about being alert to the people you're speaking to and, and having it in mind? What they're going to understand by what you say. If you say something that's true, they're going to get it wrong because they've got these other ideas. Does that make sense? Am I flogging a dead horse now? <laughs> it's kind of obvious, but we don't often pick that up. If I say to somebody, come to church with me, what do they think I'm saying? Please, are you ready for me to prevent so badly upon our relationship as two people who are friends? To take you along to a cold, drafty place, to sit on a hard seat for at least an hour out of your precious Sunday morning so that somebody can make you feel bad about yourself. Am I wrong? Because if I invite any of my brothers and 
friends or people who live around me to a church, that's what they think. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm saying you should. But, um, but I'm saying be alert to this because John knows if he says to them, yeah, I'm Elijah, that's the end of the job because they've got preconceived ideas about it. I am not, he says. I'm not the Elijah you're talking about. I'm not. Are you the prophet? It's a pH prophet, it's not a fat prophet. Okay. Well, good. I'm not going to get into that. Verse 21. Are you the prophet? The idea of Moses coming back, at least another prophet like Moses, who would speak the very words of God. It's a widespread idea of that time. The Samaritans even identified this returning the prophet with the Messiah who was expected. Now, that sort of knowledge, it adds a lot of interest to your reading of the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't it? You've heard it was said to people long ago, and it's Moses who said it. It's a quote from Moses. But I say to you, says Jesus. Jesus comes and takes up that role of prophet, the eschatological prophet who's going to come. Let's not go into that, it's a little heavy theology. John is concerned, as far as John is concerned, he says, no, not me. I'm not that prophet. So, are you the Messiah? No. Are you Elijah? No. Well, are you the prophet then? No. Well, who are you, they want to know? They're curious now. There's nothing wrong with being a little bit of curiosity. You know, it's like a carrot is better than a stick. And John has now got a tremendous pool of curiosity around him. Well, who, Johnny, are you then? We need to know. We've got people who have got to go and tell about this. Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us, verse 22. What do you say about yourself? John is dealing with a bunch of people who have a lot of preconceived ideas that they've been given by their religion. Those ideas are not right at all. And he's absolutely at pains to let these guys know who he is not. They think this and that and the next thing about, about us. We are not. And they are genuinely surprised when they do hear your true testimony. I am a sinner. I depend on his grace. They even were surprised when they learned what that means. <laughs> you think that ain't something? Huh? It's true. I am in no position to condemn or judge <coughs> because of who I am. Not who you think I think I am. I mess up. I get things wrong. I sometimes have to say sorry. There's a big load of things you might think I am that I am not. John is happy to take that on and say, I'm not these things. So now these guys, they want to know who he wants to say that he is. And so often, that's what piques curiosity. Who are you then? Verses 22 to 28, John is very clear about who he is and where he fits. John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, and the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. You never feel like being a voice in the wilderness, does it? There's sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, well, this is me, says John. This is who I am. Just a voice calling in the wilderness. So they said, well, if you're only a voice calling in the wilderness, why then do you baptize? And John said, I baptize with water. But among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. John spells out for them in biblical terms then exactly who he knows that he is. He's the voice of Isaiah 40 verse 3. So what's happening in Isaiah 40 verse 3? In Isaiah the prophet, prophet of the exilic times, he, he calls for an improvement in the road system over in the eastern desert. He calls for the levelling of hills, for the, the straightening of bends and so on, to facilitate the return of God's covenant people. They don't get that, that he can be 
claiming so little for himself if he's baptizing people. Why should he be doing this baptism thing? You know, the Essenes and various Jewish millenarian sects that were out in the desert, they were expecting the Messiah, and to show that they were sort of set apart for the kingdom of God, they used to baptize themselves every day. They baptized themselves. So, so when these Jewish leaders come along and they, they say, you are baptizing other people, <coughs> what authority then are you claiming for yourself that you should be doing it for them? Where is the authority to baptize others to be thought of as coming from? It's only God that says, John, just you wait till you see what's coming. Just you wait till you see what's coming. Again, John is pointing away from himself to the one who stands unrecognized among them, the one whose authority is so great that John wouldn't be worthy of doing the most demeaning of tasks for him. Look at him. I am not worth a tiny sandal. A job you couldn't ask the most menial person to do for you. But that one who is coming stands amongst you, unseen, to baptize with the Holy Spirit, and he is the one you've got to look to. I'm just the voice in the wilderness crying out to people, prepare the way of the Lord, who comes to redeem his people. Not John's people, not my people, he says. Through the new Exodus, set all of God's people redeemed free. So he is the one. John is clear about who he's not, he's clear about who he is, and he points to the one who comes. It's John's testimony about John. We need to be very clear to these people about who we are and who we are not. Because they ain't got the truth about those things. And they need it. <coughs> John's testimony about Jesus follows on in verses 29 to 34, more quickly. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The undergrowth has been cleared. This is not, I'm not, I'm not. But there's one coming. No, then. Here's the positive message, John's testimony about Jesus. Jesus coming towards him, there is the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world. Can you imagine that? Imagine that in the mark on Monday, standing by the burger man, somebody coming across. That is the Son of God. That is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They call for a, one of those white vans with people in funny, funny jackets, wouldn't they? John's got reason to say that. That's the difference. This is according to reason, not Right from the start, John's Gospel and John the Baptist's testimony about Jesus is that he is all about sin and sacrifice and atonement. And that is not what the Jewish emissaries in this chapter were wanting or expecting to hear. But that is the truth. It's about sin and sacrifice and atonement. We're going to be clear about Jesus. That is what Jesus is about. What's his name? What's his name? It's an easy answer. With J. It's not John. <laughs> it's Jesus. Wake up. It's Jesus. Okay? And what does his name mean? Give him the name. Jesus, but he also is Jesus in the Sunday. Thank you. It's great having people who went to Sunday school, isn't it? <laughs> Fantastic. Matthew 1, 21. Give him the name Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. Because his name means Saviour from sin. Key issues. Our God is going to call all men to account in his courtroom. And our testimony, when the papers come out, somebody's committed some scandal or other in public life or in whatever it is, that somebody's done some terrible thing, our testimony is we've got to go to him before all this. You know, I can't, I can't uh, throw stones because I don't live in a glass house. Okay? But I still can't throw stones. God is going to call every one of us to account in his courtroom, and no one's going to stand on that day by his own, his own merits, because we're all a mess. But only by the blood of the Lamb, the sacrificial Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb of God, the only one, who sacrificed for sin his own life and takes away the sins of the world. The world. This isn't just for us. We don't gather here on a Sunday for our own little club with our own little people who are all just like that share an interest in God, like you share an interest in squash on a Sunday morning. This is for the whole world. That inclusive, but exclusive too, because it's only found in him. Here's John's testimony about Jesus. He's the king born to die. 
not born and will die. He's the born to die king, and he takes away, what he does is he takes away the sins of the world, and that's where things start getting better again. He is himself the sin-bearing lamb, verse 29. And John's testimony points to him, not John, but to Jesus, who takes away the sin of the world. More than that, there's more clear positive testimony about Jesus here. He is God in the flesh, verse 30. <clears throat> Now we know from the account of the Nativity that Elizabeth had her baby before Mary. So John was born before Jesus. So what could John the Baptist be possibly saying here? This is the one I meant when I said, verse 30, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. How many before you? He was born after you. Elizabeth was pregnant and then Mary was pregnant. Okay? John was born and then later Jesus was born. What do you mean, John? There's an enigma. Don't be afraid of enigmas. Enigmas are good. Great matter around a bit, stir it up, and they're good with people we're, we're, we're talking to as well. Here's what John has told us so far In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, that life was the light of all mankind. He is painting a picture of God eternal, identifying Him with the Word. And then He says, The Word became flesh and made it become among us. We, says John. John was writing, not John the Baptist. We, John was writing, says, we have seen his glory. We have seen him. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Who came from the Father? Who is full of grace and truth? Who is the creator? Jesus Christ. John testified concerning him. And he cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So, verse 30 here, what we are looking at, refers back to all that that came before. And shows that John is identifying Jesus as creator, God, come to earth in the flesh. Jesus is God in the flesh, come as the sin-bearing, sacrificial lamb, giving his life for the sin of the world to redeem us out of the mess we've made of our lives. That's what we've got to do. Not what a lovely man, so, so Christian. God made flesh, laid down his life to pay the price of my sin. That is John's testimony about Jesus. It is uncompromising, it is understandable, it is clear. He hasn't finished yet, because this is the new covenant Messiah. Verses 31 and 34, again, <clears throat> picks up reference to what John says. He said it earlier in the chapter, it now says again here, verses 31 and 34. <clears throat> I myself didn't know, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. And then John gave this testimony, verse 32, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. Now the Messiah, Messiah is a word that means the anointed one. Anointed with oil as a symbol of being anointed with the Holy Spirit. Do you want to ask me something? Mm -hmm. Go for it. I myself did not know him. Yeah. They were cousins. <coughs> yeah. It, sorry, okay, the word. Uh, yeah. The word is a word that indicates an understanding of somebody. So, I know you. Then I might not grasp. Okay. Does that make sense? That's a very quick. Sorry. Is it clear enough? Yeah. Tell me if it's not come really something today, and I won't necessarily be clear. Am I speaking too quickly? Okay. Mm -hmm. So look, here's the stuff about the Spirit being given. I saw the Spirit come down, like He was Messiah before my very eyes. He was acknowledged as the Messiah, as the Spirit falls in the form of a dove upon Him. He is the Anointed of God. Right. He who sent me to baptize with water told me the one, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down in the name, is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I've seen and I testify this is God's chosen one, this is the Messiah. Now you really don't need me to drag you through the Old Testament prophecies about the new era, the new covenant, when the Spirit would come, and so forth. You don't need me to do that. Let's content ourselves with the prophecy of Joel chapter 2, where the Spirit will get poured out on all flesh. See, see, all, not just the Jews, right? 
Spirit poured out on all flesh, who will then have a close personal relationship with God. Your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, they'll prophesy and so on and so on. So you've got that spirit of prophecy from Joel chapter 2, which happens in Acts 2, where that new covenant relationship is inaugurated between God and his people where we know him, <laughs> and he sort of leads us and speaks through us and stuff. You had that experience this week where God has sort of given you an inkling sign. What's happening? The Spirit of God has been put in your heart. Right? He's given you an inkling. Or, or maybe he's given you something to say in a situation and somebody might or might not have turned you and said, how did you know that? Well, and you don't. But he's given you something to say and it's there and it's for real. Now, is that part of our testimony for Jesus? No, we don't want to be sort of free, freaky weirdos where, you know, with people, because that really spooks people out. They, they don't get to know Jesus that way, okay? But it is our, it is our testimony, isn't it? As a God who's alive, he's really talks to us, and he does stuff, and he's very gentle with us, and he doesn't come, you know, zooming in off a cloud like those angels in the film. You know, oh, no, oh, oh, oh. Right? He doesn't do all that stuff. <laughs> but he leads his people gently by the hand. <coughs> and this is the nature of the new covenant like a baptism, a cataclysmic change. That's it. There's the long and the short of it, and now John has finished his work. He's prepared the way for the Lord. He's been that voice crying in the desert, and he's gone, It's him! There's the one! Look at that. He's prepared the way for the Lord. He's identified Jesus as the one who comes to inaugurate the new covenant in the age of the Spirit, trying to step away from all my theological baggage and just put it in English and it's not working. John is going to move aside, okay? John is going to move aside. His followers will shift their allegiance and Jesus will now begin preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, believe the gospel. Give the riches of God for you. John has pointed his followers away from himself to the one to whom he points. And now, job done, John is about to fade away. This is part of our testimony to Jesus. Our willingness to point away from ourselves and to fade away <coughs> it is a powerful part of finishing well in a lifetime of testimony to Jesus to give it to the next guys. If they're no good at it, it's half your fault. We've looked at John's testimony about John, that's really important, verses 9 to 28. We've looked at John's testimony about Jesus, that's really important, verses 29 to 34. And now here comes Andrew's testimony about Jesus, verses 35 to 41, and this is where the rubber hits the road for you and me. Because you and me, we're not talking about this, okay? We're on him. But we're much more like Andrew. Almost he stands in his story. The focus now shifts to the testimony of Andrew to Jesus. And it starts where on the basis of John's commendation of Jesus, Andrew also starts to inquire after Jesus. The next day John was there again with two of his disciples, John's precious disciple. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. He said again, he said again. And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed John the Baptist. Follow that guy. With his own disciple. Didn't think John had a hard ministry gathering these people together? Not easy to be a prophet out of the desert dressed in those funny shirts and you know, eating locusts and honey, was it? I mean, it's not, it's not the high life, is it? Really? John had recommended Jesus to them. Verses 35 and 6. John recommended Jesus to them. And we recommend Jesus to the people around us. And we recommend Jesus to the people we love. Yeah. And then what do they do? They pack their bags, they say, 
and shove off the gloves on the other side, you know? <laughs> what happens next? The gun. So Jesus. Because it is all about Jesus. When did we last recommend Jesus to anybody, I mean specifically in their life circumstances, applying his grace to their need? When did we last turn to the blood was pouring his heart out? Sorry, it's all male illustrations. Sorry about that. When did we last turn to the guy next to us and say, hey mate, all this problem you're having with your marriage, all this trouble you're having with your teenage kid, you know what you need? What? Big stick? No, Jesus. You need to be doing this following Jesus, because he's the only one who can help you with this. I'll be your mate, but you need a savior. <laughs> Get in the habit of being able to look somebody in the eye and tell them with all your heart. That's a clear testimony to Jesus. You've got no idea what's going to kick off next when you do, right? It could be quite exciting, but that's part of it too. I've been learning this week, let me tell you, I've been learning this verse this week about um, Paul writes to Timothy, the young disciple, and he says, You, my son, keep your head in all situations, do a hardship, do the work of an evangelist. Hardship is no reason to back off, is it? John had recommended Jesus to these guys, and that's what we need to do with people. They need to know from us because we know it's true because what we've had and seen. Okay? We need to follow Jesus. Simple. So having been recommended Jesus, Andrew and his friends physically followed Jesus. You don't learn from him outside of the right place. You've got to follow him. I'm afraid you don't. You need, you need to come to Jesus. God reveals himself to the folks he's calling when they gather around him, gather around his word. And you can mock him, you can deride preaching all you want, but it's pressing around his feet, it's attending to his word that brings his life into the heart and soul of man. Somebody contacted him yesterday by email, young fella, I knew years ago, uh, <coughs> came into our congregation, God had been at work in his heart and life, had been around punk, punk culture and all that. And he came to the church and he started to hear about Jesus and in one sermon. About ten minutes in I began to see his face change. And year after year, time after time, when we have some, you know, punk church buildings and stuff, where we can use and we start stuff in and all that, you'd see people come along and you'd see them exposed to the word of God. And you'd see them changed. Freaky. That's the way it is, you've got to come to Jesus. Okay, now here comes the bit we've been heading towards. Simon, Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John said, who followed Jesus. First thing that Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah. This is 40 to 42. The first thing Andrew did, he doesn't have to ever develop theology, he doesn't have to open a training course, and he doesn't need to be wild about you. Okay, so what he needs is to have met Jesus, learned from him, sat at his feet, learned from him. And the first thing he does, we're told, is go and find his brother, intentionality, and tell him, we have found the Messiah, explicit, and he brought him to Jesus. Come here. You want your lunch. There's a huge emphasis here, isn't there, by way of conclusion? There is a huge emphasis on personal contact, on personal recommendation, on personal pointing away from me and bringing people to Jesus, isn't there? Huge. Now, I've been around the shops and around the doors and I try to be a friendly sort of chap and I try to make a reasonable impression on people with the truth, with the good news about Jesus. But look what's happening here. One tells another about his genuine personal encounter with Jesus. With the sense that Jesus makes of life. With the truth that Jesus represents. One brings another. Urgently, straight away he went out. Found his brother. Brought him to Jesus. Urgently. Self-abasement. Look at what John does. It's not about me, it's about him. Not a can of worms, but he's fantastic. Fulfillment. 
This is the one who fulfills all that the Bible has been going on about for century after century after century. Look at that. Conveying both real personal experience and truth. Bringing people not to our club, not to our side, not to our tribe, but to our Jesus. The Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world that's not got the job in the first place. And that's what we lack. And that's what Wales lacks. And that's what we're in the mess we're in. 